Kingsley was happily married to a beautiful woman. Many people that thought that he'd done very well. Even Kingsley couldn't quite believe he was married to this woman. He loved his wife and they had a beautiful daughter. Then things changed. War broke out and Kingsley opposed the war on conscience grounds. Um, the states didn't like conscientious objectors, so Kingsley went to jail. He was separated from everything he held dear, his job, his wife, his daughter. Kingsley was alone. However, after some time behind bars, Kingsley was secretly and mysteriously released and sent on a top secret mission. For Kingsley was a police officer and he was sent to the front to investigate the alleged murder of a high profile officer. Kingsley arrived in France and began his investigations. He was helped in his inquiries by a young woman, Nurse Murray. She treated Kingsley with a degree of suspicion. Nonetheless, Kingsley remained polite and acted kindly towards her. Then one night, after Kingsley had finished his day's investigation, he left and walked to the inn to where he was staying. He took a shortcut through the woods. It was a dark, wet evening and suddenly he heard someone else with him. Someone had followed him. It was Nurse Murray. What did she want? Was she the murderer? Soon it became obvious what she wanted. She drew Kingsley towards him and kissed him. Now Kingsley hadn't sought this but now it had come he didn't want it to stop. He was intoxicated. It had been so, so long, away from his wife, alone, but now he felt a woman close to him. Kingsley withdrew in a, suddenly in a spate of rationality. But, but I'm married, he stammered. I love my wife. And he was going through an almighty inner battle. He hadn't been with a woman for so long and he was unlikely to ever return to his wife. And here was a woman who wanted him. But he was still married. He would promised to be faithful until death do us part. What would he do? Give in to his lust or remain faithful? What might you do in a situation like that, in the dark, far away from home where no one is watching, no one will ever know? Your feelings rise up and you feel temptation, a surge of desire, a trial. Kingsley's story is a story of temptation, of trials. He felt voices and feelings inside calling, tugging, begging him. The battle of, that Kingsley face is a battle that we all face. Maybe not necessarily sexual temptation, but we all face a variety of temptations and trials in our lives. Indeed, a famous Australian politician once said that life wasn't meant to be easy. And so what do we make of temptation? How should we respond to the trials in our lives? Well, this is what James chapter 1 is dealing with. And he offers wisdom when facing trials. Sorry, I'm just going to get my... Sorry. That wasn't a very wise move um, to, to leave the clicker behind. But anyway, in verse 2, James writes concerning the various trials that Christian believers face. When he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now here, James doesn't specify exactly what these trials are, but they could be trials for uh, an opposition for being Christian. But they're likely to be the trials and temptations of life. And James are going to outline some specific trials in, later in today's passage. But surprisingly, James says that these trials should be accompanied with joy. It's a strange emotion to welcome trials and temptations with joy. But James explains why in verses 3 and 4. He says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So trials help grow us. Mature us in our faith and trust of God. 
But trials require maturity and wisdom to know how to handle them correctly. Because you see in verse 5, it says, any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. Now this is a guaranteed answer to prayer. In the face of trials and temptations, if you pray for wisdom, it will be given to you. There aren't many prayers for which a positive answer is guaranteed. I desperately want my football team to win tonight. I am praying, but there is no guarantee that my prayer will be answered positively. I pray for good health outcomes for people in our congregation, but there is no guarantee that a prayer for complete healing and full recovery will ever be given. But if you want a prayer with a guaranteed answer, a prayer that you know will be answered positively, then in the face of a trial or a temptation, ask God for wisdom and it will be given. God promises wisdom to those who ask for it. What exactly is wisdom? Well, wisdom is different from knowledge. For wisdom is more than just knowing lots of things. Wisdom is about showing discernment. It's about making good decisions and living life well. The great philosopher Immanuel Kant once said, science is organised knowledge, wisdom is organised life. And hence another way of looking at wisdom is perhaps this quote, knowledge is knowing what to say, wisdom is knowing when to say it. And it's also applied in this third quote here. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. Wisdom is about making wise choices to live life well. And in many ways, the book of James provides God's wisdom for life. For James is a bit like wisdom literature. Like the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. James provides ethical and wise pronouncements, things the wise person ought to pay attention to. And that's why we've entitled this series, The Search for Wisdom, as we engage the profound reflections in this book. And the promise of this part of the Bible is that if you, is that if you ask for wisdom, it will be given to you. And so then what wisdom do we have then in the face of trials and temptations? We see some of these wise pronouncements in the following verses, particularly in verses 9 to 11, where James writes about the trials of poverty. And in this section, James addresses uh, the brother of humble circumstances. Now, I think humble circumstances here is a euphemism for poverty. Whilst not explicitly described as a trial, economic poverty makes sense of the context. Poverty and malnutrition were endemic in the ancient world. Mere survival, for many, particularly the poor, was a challenge. The frequency of war, political instability, inconsistent food supply and no safety net made virtually everyone vulnerable to food crises. Life for the average citizen was a trial. Life certainly wasn't easy, even back then. There was nothing that the poor, the person in humble circumstances could boast about. They were excluded from politics and the pleasures of social life, you know, the dinners, the gymnasia, the bathhouses. And with poverty also came shame. The ancient world, much like modern Asian thinking, was an honour-shame culture. They thought that avoiding shame was essential in society and honour was the ultimate asset in human beings. So Aristotle said, honour is a sign of a reputation for doing good and benefactors, above all, are are justly honoured. The ultimate prize was honour and in this culture it was perfectly acceptable to boast about your achievements. And in this society you did all you could to avoid bringing shame onto your family like being poor. There was nothing to boast about in poverty. Poverty was shameful. The Roman poet Juvenal said, There is nothing in the calamity of poverty that is harder to bear than it makes it that the fact that it makes men ridiculous. Poverty brought vulnerability, exclusion, and shame. Living in humble circumstances in poverty would have been a real test 
a trial. It's a different type of trial to sexual temptation, but it's a trial nonetheless. A trial just to survive, a trial to overcome exclusion, a trial to cope with shame, a trial to not curse God. And then look in James 1.9 to how the believer should respond. What, what is wisdom amidst this trial? And then we see in verse 9 what the poor believer should do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride, boast in their high position. Then in verse 10 we see what the rich believer should do. That they should take pride, boast in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower. Amidst these trials, believers should take pride or, or boast in the certainty of the gospel and not in fading riches. James is saying that believers, both poor and rich, should think differently to their prevailing culture. Believers shouldn't boast or expect honour or take their identity from riches or wealth. Instead, they should boast or see their identity in something that is certain in the gospel. The poor should boast in their exaltation in Christ with the gospel of salvation from sins and eternal life. They have everything. They may be physically poor, excluded, shamed and vulnerable, yet they are secure, valuable and exalted in Christ. Their honour is in Christ and this is what they should boast in. Conversely, the rich shouldn't boast in their wealth because riches are uncertain. They'll fade away. Look in verse 11. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. The global financial crisis of 2008 demonstrate the fading qualities of wealth. It was estimated that Americans lost nearly $10 trillion in wealth through declining house prices or stock values at that time. So instead, rich believers should boast in something that is certain, which is their humiliation. Now it's odd that they should boast in humiliation. This would have been extremely strange for someone in the ancient honour-shame culture. What sort of humiliation is he speaking about? Well, I think he's speaking about the humiliation that would have come from being a Christian and from being associated with Jesus, a humble man who died on a cross, a humble king, so to speak, who died on a cross. Our minds today can't really appreciate how revolutionary this was. In modern Australia, we do value humility. Yet the prizing of humility is a distinctly and uniquely Christian invent invention. Humility wasn't valued in the ancient world. Society valued honour and rarely, if ever, considered humility virtuous. In fact, humility was considered crushed or debased. It was associated with failure and shame. And yet the Christian message is a message of humiliation. It's a message where Jesus let go of his entitlements to exaltation and glory, to instead humiliate himself by dying on a cross for sinful people like you and me. Death on the cross was the most shameful and most brutal of punishments in the ancient world. It was worse than decapitation or being burned alive. And ancient Roman philosophers thought that any other form of death was preferable to crucifixion. Yet the Christian message has crucifixion at its centre. A message of humiliation. Anyone who followed this would be ridiculed, laughed at, humiliated like this piece of Roman graffiti I've shared this before but this Roman graffiti showing a young man worshipping a crucified donkey headed figure with the inscription Alex Amenos worships his God Romans thought it was a joke that someone would worship a foolish crucified person so it was just like worshipping a donkey and this is what the rich person is to boast in. They're to boast in it because the humiliation and humility of Jesus on the cross is at the centre of the Christian message. Unlike wealth or honour or privilege, 
It, this is certain and it leads to hope, elevation and exaltation. So amidst the, the trials, the temptations or perhaps or the trials of poverty, believers should boast in the certainty of the gospel and not in fading riches. And James summarises this in verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood that test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Poverty and economic challenges are a type of trial, yet James encourages believers to persevere, to continue to boast in their message about Jesus. And by doing so, they will be blessed. They receive the crown of life. This is the gift of God to those who love him. Perseverance amidst testing leads to life with God. And so, as we go through life, we experience all kinds of trials and temptations. But then a question emerges. Well, why does God tempt me? Why did he make me poor? Why did he put that charming person in my way? Why does God put me in awkward situations? And James responds to this in verses 13 and 14 by explaining the origin of temptation. He says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. God never tempts. It's true that God is sovereign and he's powerful and he does put attractive or charming people in our path. Yet God is pure. He is holy and never uses evil to tempt. The origin of temptation is within verse 14 but each oops sorry but each person is tempted when they are this is a, there's a story coming yeah. <laughs> tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed whatever those desires greed financial revenge justice sexual relational temptation ultimately comes through one's individual own desires now as some of you may have realized i sometime back i read the story about Wayne Carey the uh, former AFL footballer who was regarded perhaps as one of the greatest players who ever played the game. Yet his life began unravelling when he started flirting with Kelly Stevens, the attractive wife of his close friend and vice captain, Anthony. Kerry describes how this relationship began. He says he was drawn towards her in a way that he couldn't really explain with conversations dripping with sexual innuendo. They got closer and closer and the temptation built and built until finally they did. They slept together and had an affair. And Carey describes how he felt. He said, We knew we were entering very dangerous territory, but some strange force, lust, danger, intrigue, physical attraction, I'm not sure, prevented us from saying, Stop, this is totally ridiculous. Each person is tempted and when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Woody Allen, who effectively had an affair with the daughter of his um, partner, Mia Farrow, said, the heart wants what it wants. Carey may not have been able to fully articulate what was happening to him, but he recognised that it was his own desires, his own selfishness that was driving him. And there's almost a sense that he can see that this is not wise. And the outcome? Well, it ended up virtually destroying his life. He left the kangaroos and he said, it seemed the, the only reasonable thing to do, but I've never coped with that loss. For a long time, my state of mind was shot. I destroyed my relationship with my wife. I lost my career, most of my friends and my dignity. I also lost my family at North Melbourne, which had become the family I'd never had as a child. That's a lot to lose in one day and it's taken me the best part of eight years to come to terms with it. It's tragic. Almost like a form of death. James 1.15 Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. James outlines a process. Desire, then sin, then sin leads to Death. Giving birth to death. 
It's a grotesque image. Birth is the beginning of new life. Yet James says here is death is the end result of sin. And the death James speaks of here is a form of spiritual death. It can lead to a kind of relational and emotional death that Wayne Carey experienced. But it's more, sin leads to separation from God. And this spiritual death ultimately leads to physical death. And in this passage here, James doesn't mean that if you succumb to temptation, then you die immediately. Like, you know, there's a giant laser just going to zap you. No. The kind of death here is like, maybe like, a bit more like the mobile phone or laptop kind of death, if you never plug it in. It's severed from the power source. It's a separation from the source of life. And in this passage, it's hard not to reflect on Genesis 2, where the Lord commands Adam not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the apple or whatever it might have been, because he says that the warning is that on the day that you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now Adam did eat from the tree. He succumbed to his desires and he died. He wasn't zapped with a laser immediately, but his rebellion left him separated, estranged from God, the source of life. The wages of sin is death. And Kingsley, our police officer that we heard about earlier, well, what happened to him? Well, he gave in. He let desire germinate and he gave birth to sin. He made love to Nurse Murray in that wet, dark forest and in some way there, he died. He couldn't say, God is tempting me by having a woman throw herself at me. He could have refused. He could have pushed Nurse Murray away. But no, his evil desires dragged him away and enticed him. He hadn't sought it, but he wanted it. The trial of the temptation beat him. And the consequence, separation from God, spiritual and then ultimate death. So James warns in verse 16, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived by the power of sin. Don't be deceived by the effects of sin. Don't be deceived by the various trials and temptations which come along. Succumbing to the sinful temptations within leads to spiritual death. Yet despite human sinfulness, God is good. Even though humans are frail and weak, even though the gospel of Jesus, there is transformation. Because we are made new. Look there in verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. There is a massive contrast here from the darkness and death of sin and evil desire in verse 13 to 16. Here we see goodness and light. And the source of this light, well, it's not from ourselves, but from God, the Father of lights. And here is an allusion to Genesis 1 where God made the sun and the moon, the two great lights to have dominion over the day and night. For God is the source of day, sorry, the source of light, life, and all things good. And through his goodness, we are saved from the effects of our trials. Look there in verse 18. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Now notice here that we're not saved by our own efforts. It's not by our own achievements, but by his choice. Trials and temptations can lead to destruction and death, but in his goodness, God saved us from this by his will. I think there's a, a crucial misunderstanding of the Christian faith in our world. Many people think a person is saved because they're good. A person is a Christian because they're morally upright. But this isn't the message of the Bible. That's not what James is saying here. Salvation is by the will of God. It's by his choice. And Mark Twain once remarked that heaven goes by favour. For it went by merit, then you would stay out and your dog would go in. We are in relationship with God because he chose to give us new life, new birth. And notice the contrast in birthing images here. In verse 15, our own evil desires give birth to sin, which gives birth to death. Yet here, through the good gift of God... We have a new birth to life, real life, with the Father of lights. And this is what a new birth is supposed to be about. New life 
not death. The contrast between darkness and light, death and life, couldn't be more stark. Then at the final comment in verse 18, we are given a new birth for a purpose, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Now, fruit's been a bit of a theme today, I think, which was which is good, but first fruits was an agricultural image of the Old Testament, which required the presentation of the Lord of the first of the harvest. The first fruits of the crop were to be the very best. They were specifically holy to the Lord. But James isn't thinking about the farm when he uses this image. He's thinking about people, people just like us. Those whom God has chosen are his first fruits, delicious and juicy, holy and different, set apart, special and distinctive. First fruits made for God given in dedication to him, people who are transformed by God to live differently. It's such a fresh, exciting, wholesome way of living. And this is why this is the wise way to live. Living in light of light, so living the life of light and life, a life beyond ourselves with selfish, evil, dark and sinful desires which can lead to death. Through God's goodness, he makes us new. And though we face various trials, testings and troubles, we persevere in God's goodness and receive life. Overcoming trials is not an exercise in human willpower. This passage is saying that we need to work hard at this by ourselves. It's ultimately the work of God. His work of salvation is a gift of grace. Him changing us and helping us persevere. Some time back I stumbled across the story of David Ewart. And I, as I read this story, it seemed as though he had experienced and lived this passage. He had experienced trials and the very darkness, the darkest of human sinfulness. He'd been married for 26 years and been faithful for that whole time. Yet at a conference he met a younger woman. They hit it off and they were both married. They weren't overly happy in their relationships with their spouses. And David admits that My mind ran with the emotional and fulfilling attention that she poured out on me. I had in my mind made myself like a sponge for any type of attention. I had changed my beliefs. I told myself that I owed myself a new relationship. What deception. He never committed physical adultery with her, but his mind did. He communicated almost every day with her. He considered himself the double-minded man that James talks about as he wrestled with his inner battle. And he decided to confess to his wife. And he did. They argued and then he says tragically, my anger got out of control and it resulted in me murdering her. This passage says, but each person is tempted and they are dragged away by, by their own evil desire and enticed. And after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown, gives birth to death. David rightly says that there's no one to blame except himself. What he did was the vilest and worst expression of sin. His sin led to death, the unnecessary death of his innocent wife. And to say this decision was unwise is a gross understatement. And he acknowledges what he did was deeply wrong. And he says, I'm not looking for sympathy. I simply feel God wants me to express how important it is to keep your eyes on the Lord and seek to obey his word in all things. We are under attack all the time. Our society has become obsessed with sexual pleasure. It seems no matter that where you turn, you are bombarded with individuals selling sexual pleasure. He goes on and says, Yes, I have lost everything that was dear to me. My two grandchildren do not communicate with me. I have never seen or touched any of my grandchildren. I robbed my children of ever being kissed or hugged by their mother. I robbed my grandchildren of ever knowing their grandmother. I've lost all my material wealth. I've lost almost every friend that I had. I've lost contact with almost all my family. And yet amidst this darkness and evil, David found something. He goes on. But I now know who Jesus Christ is. He came to my cell and forgave me all my sins. He set me free inside. He called me again to preach his mighty message. I now have a captive audience in prison. And I have received the invitation into my heart. Now if that story has raised or is raised, raised issues for you, maybe you've experienced or are experiencing 
the birth of and death, sorry, the, the birth of sin and death in your relationships. And please talk to someone or maybe call a number like one eight hundred respect. But please know that what David Ewart did was deeply, deeply wrong. It was the graphic expression of how awful and destructive human trials and temptation can be, of how horrifying the idea that sin leads to death is. But this story also shows true wisdom amidst trials. As David Ewart was found by Jesus Christ and he genuinely repented from his sin and saw that how he was enticed by sin in his life, the story shows the grace and mercy of God, that though he thoroughly deserved prison, punishment and death, that in the end, by the will of God, David Ewart was given new birth by the message of truth so that he could be a part of the first fruits of God, the first fruits that God has created. Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge the many trials and temptations that come to us. And we ask you for wisdom to deal with such trials so that we may not be double-minded, tossed around, but help us to live as your people, worthy of the gospel, to your glory, bearing much fruit in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. James 1, 1 to 2 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let's pray. Father, may we go from here encouraged to live for you, empowered by your spirit, confident that we can face trials and temptations with the wisdom that you give us. May we live for you in all things, bringing you much glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that brings us to the end of our, our formal time together this morning. I think the youth are going to be bringing out some morning tea um, and some opportunities. Stick around, uh, have, a, have a cuppa, as they say, and uh, chat to someone. And I think the rain, I don't know if it's easing off at all, but anyway, I hope that the, you have a great week and we look forward to seeing you back here again next week as we continue the search for wisdom as we continue our journey through the book of James. Thanks and we'll see you next week.